keep this the rest conference of your will boxes. now be recorded. So if you can put your cameras on, it's better because then I can see you. But otherwise, if you feel embarrassed, like your hair is terrible like mine or something, then you don't have to. OK, so um, am I good to start? Katie, thumbs up. Great. The rest of you people who are faces I cannot see. I'm very disappointed. Um, so uh, I hope you've all got a drink and something to settle down into. Um, I was asked to give a talk on NEC, which I'm sure you've had like millions of talks on NEC. So I thought I'd sort of talk a little bit about the surgical decision making uh, behind why we do what we do, if that's all right. Uh, if it's really boring, say something. Don't just leave. Uh, and we can change topic. Like I've got a million presentations we can change to if you get bored. Um, and like keep talking and asking questions because it'll be better and like more dynamic because this is already weird enough talking to my computer screen with none of your faces I can see apart from Katie. All right, so let's see if this works. Can you see stuff? Yes, everyone can see. Uh, if you don't want to talk to me, then you can chat in the little chat thing. As you can see, I like writing things in chat boxes. Um, so fine. So I'll talk a little bit about NEC, but please stop me um, if you've got questions. Um, put your cameras on if you want. Um, and let's see how we get on. I hope you've all got a drink. Right, so surgical management of NEC. So this is a baby with NEC, obviously. Um, they've got a big horrible tummy. Um, they've got umbilical discoloration, which is really sensitive actually in babies of, of trouble. Uh, you can see they've got bruising in their flanks. So they've got the full complement of everything horrible. And they've got some blood in the nappy. Um, so this is a pretty bad tummy. And that was that baby's x-ray actually um and like i i guess you've all done neonates of some description i'm talking at or to um but this is uh, an x-ray that i got for you because it really does show pneumatosis so you can, i don't know if you can see my little cursor you might not be able to um but on the um right hand side of the screen you can see what's called pneumatosis and it's actually air in the bowel wall and actually you actually get air in the bowel wall so this is what you're seeing on the x-ray um you don't often see it so beautifully but you can see these bubbles of air in the bowel wall and this is pretty horrible bowel this is nec this is what it looks like operatively this little pink little sausage down here is sort of normal looking bowel there's a little chat can see excellent good um and th this stuff is is white it's dead um and it needs chopping out so i guess the aims of this talk were to sort of talk to you about some of the decision making behind what we do at nec some of the operative strategies um that you'll see employed you know why have they come back from theater with bleh this happened to them or why is there a difference between this baby and the last baby um a little about outcomes uh, with NEC, which will be super depressing, which is great for COVID. So I hope you've all got a drink. So we all know about modified bell staging. Ignore bell stage one. It's not anything that is NEC. It's just sepsis and um, uh, ignore that. So we, we're, we're talking about babies who have, you know, pneumatosis, things that you can see on an x-ray, um, signs of uh, a systemic response to being unwell, uh, and then you've got varying stages of, of disaster. Is it useful? Um, I mean, people use it to report cases. Is it useful if you're talking, trying to refer babies? It isn't, is it? I mean, the, the things that we're worried about are to do with how long it's been going on for, whether there's free air, um, we want to know about platelet count, we want to know about the baby's response to medical treatment. So actually modified bell staging isn't very useful clinically. Um, so why do we intervene? Um, 
do you know what? You're not the one who's going to listen. I want if you don't want to talk to me, you can chat as to what are the what are the reasons that will intervene for babies with NEC. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You talk, I'm drinking my beer. Somebody tells them that bacteria, perforation, definitely. That is an absolute indication to intervene. Okay. Uh, any other indications to intervene? You're at Shiloh, aren't you? Like, I'm here, out on a limb, drinking beer talking to you and you are not talking to me. It's so sad. Hang on, wait, chats are coming through, woo. Failure to respond to medical management. Um, and I think that, that those are the other, those are the other two. So it's failure um, And that's absolutely true. And so these are babies in whom You've started NEC treatment, you maybe tr maybe transfer them to a surgical centre or you haven't quite transferred to the surgical centre and you see what happens. And, and, and it's usually pretty obvious the babies are either going to get better or they won't. And the, that period of time is a couple of days. Um, there are some markers, some really interesting things which are good predictors of whether you're going to fail medical management. And one of the things that's not written in any textbooks, but which I'm going to tell you a secret because you're also chatty and you're my friends tonight, is that if you st still see pneumatosis on an x-ray 48 hours after you initially see it that's a pretty good sign that the bowel is dead okay so persistent pneumatosis is really important people talk about things like fixed loops or uh, and all that stuff I, I don't quite understand what that is and i never quite have but uh, deterioration in the face of maximal intervention a persistent mass or obstruction so actually what can happen is the babies can get better but actually they form an inflammatory mass about around whatever's happened they get a little abscess or finally they can get obstructed so those are our indications to intervene um, these are the things which people have done studies saying how specific and sensitive uh, the chances of you getting an operation obviously if you get pneumatosis Someone went and did some studies, looked at paracentesis, sticking needles in babies. I mean, that's totally ridiculous. M says, so would you have a pneumoperitoneum and it self-resolve? Well, that's a really interesting thing, M, who doesn't want to talk to me because they don't want to go on the microphone, which is very sad. M, do you want to mute your microphone? Talk about this. M, nothing. OK, um, it is possible to get something called a spontaneous intestinal perforation, which is babies, little babies who get a perforation. Someone does an X-ray in the middle of the night. There's definitely free air on the X-ray. And the next day, the baby's absolutely fine. And it's sealed itself. And, and there are a small number of babies who have what's called spontaneous internal, intestinal perforation. They don't seem to get massive systemic upset from it. Um, and pathologically, it looks completely different. Like all the bowels normal apart from this little bit with a hole in it. Um, is it NEC? Um, people have tried to distinguish between that and NEC and it's probably part of the same spectrum, but who knows? So yes, in answer to your question, M, who won't talk to me, he's gonna run off at some point. Um, it is possible to get a perforation and it can seal. And so you can see a baby who's had an X-ray before and then they're all better. Um, I'll come back to perforations in, in a minute because uh, that's those babies with what's called SIP um, are probably important in terms of, oh look, you can see me, that's not so good, okay, it's better, I look like I was in the dark in dungeons. Okay, so a little bit about operative intervention. Um, I, I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about what's going to dictate what management we do. Some of it's to do with the disease and some of it is actually to do with the baby okay um so disease distribution um of all the babies who get an operation about half will have patchy involvement of the small and large bowel okay so it, it tends to be a disease which is kind of everywhere um but it doesn't affect everything um 
a small number will have an isolated small bowel segment which is involved so you can kind of imagine that that might have been a thrombotic event that actually you can take out a little arcade in the bowel um, some babies have pan intestinal NEC and, and these babies I think they're quite, de they're quite easy to predict which of these babies these are again they have pan intestinal NEC this is the baby who is IEGR, born at 400 grams, has always had a, a distended abdomen, never been quite right, and then minding their own business in Skaboo at 31 weeks of age, and then suddenly falls in a pile, massively acidotic, metabolic acidosis. Um, you will have seen babies like this. And, and, and there's something about that disease process which is different to regular NEC. And panicyl gangrene is just kind of worsened version of NEC. Um, the, the principles of the management are, are pretty simple actually and NEC surgery is very easy uh, like I could teach any of you how to do it it's not difficult at all okay what we are trying to do is we're trying to manage so we're trying to remove bubbles from the peritoneal cavity to allow the antibiotics to work we're trying to remove as little bowel as we possibly can and I've said mind the liver pretty much the only thing that's going to cause babies to die on the table apart from those who have got pan intestinal NEC is causing a bleed in the liver now the liver in babies uh any of you been to theater babies who've been operated on it's such a chatty bunch nothing oh wait there's a chat Woo! yes ju thanks ju um so um the, the liver occupies a massive amount of space in the baby's abdomen and it often comes down below the level of the umbilicus and the liver is then tense it's full of fluid the babies are coagulopathic they have no platelet counts if you touch the liver if you pull the liver in the wrong way if you look at it funny it will start bleeding and if it starts bleeding it won't stop bleeding and they will die so babies who die from bleeding it's bleeding from the liver um so there's stuff about stomas versus anastomoses. You all worked at different places. Um, if you worked at surgical centres, some babies come back with stomas. Um, some centres prefer to do a primary anastomosis. Um, what's the evidence for it? Actually, there probably isn't very much evidence to support either approach in preference to another. So it tends to be a unit-based based approach. There's never been a randomised control trial about it. And there's something about which patients you're going to do it in. Now, if you've got a baby who is dying in front of you, trying to do an anastomosis, which is going to take you 20 minutes uh, on a good occasion, or a stoma, which is going to take you five minutes, you're going to do the stoma. Um, the people who are pro-stoma will say that this is a really easy thing to do. It gets you out of trouble and it gets the baby back to the intensive care unit or back into the incubator if you're on the intensive care unit. Um, so that's why you would do a stoma or an astomosis. Um, these are different sorts of stomas. Do we care? Probably you don't care. Um, babies can have stomas where the functional end and the mucous fistula, so the ostomate and mucous fistula can either be next to each other, can be separated apart in the wound, and people do all sorts of crazy things with them. Some babies, the bowel, distal bowel is really, really sick looking and we end up bringing up a very high stoma. These are high jejunostomies. These babies can't establish central feeding and we really worry about these babies' livers and want to be thinking about closing them very early. Uh, and we can put it in the wound or away from the wound and there are various pros and cons to that and you don't need to know about that because you're paediatricians. How am I doing? It is, are we okay? Are we going too fast? Are we going too slow? Mm. Hang on a second, we've got questions. Woo! Go team. Quang Yang Li says, how do you decide whether to clip and drop the distal end or bring it out to a mucous fistula? That is a really interesting question. And the answer is, um, some of it's about surgeon preference. Um, if you bring it out as a mucous fistula, when you come back to close the stoma together, you've got your two ends up by the skin. So actually all you need to do is to 
um, to stack those two ends and join them together. In theory, it makes it an easier operation because you don't have to go fishing for the other end. That's what we bring out of the fishler. Some centres, and I don't know if you work at Kings, maybe, or south of the river. Anyone ever been south of the river? Don't go there, it's very dangerous. Someone south of the river. So Kings, they like refeeding. If they have a high stoma, they, they feed into the bowels. So some people use the mucus fistula to refeed what comes out of the stoma uh, to put down to keep the bowel healthy. Um, so those are the reasons why you might have a mucus fistula. Uh, JU says, what is your personal experience of primary leaks? JU, I've never had an anastomotic leak. How very dare you? No, I'm only joking. Um, I have done, I do very few primary anastomoses for NEC and the reason for that is I am, it, it is an appropriate thing for the thing that we talked about called SIP, spontaneous intestinal perforation, where all the rest of the bowel is relatively healthy and the baby is relatively healthy. In order for the ends of your bowel to join together, we put a row of stitches around but actually what you, what you want is good vascularity, um, a nice healthy immune system, which is gonna allow the bowel to heal, and um, stability, and all the things you don't have in NEC. Now, you can do it, but you, I would argue that in the context of someone who is very sick, doing a stoma and coming back in six weeks time, it's safe to do a primary anastomosis in the majority of patients. Someone got bored and left, probably without asking a question. Alice K says, doing good. Thanks, Alice. You're doing great as well. It's not good if I can't see anyone, is it, Katie? I like, you're the only one who's playing. Boring, the rest of you. Uh, Quang Yang Lee says, what is damage control laparotomy? Quang, that is a fascinating question. That is a concept. Uh, damage control surgery is something that we talk about in terms of trauma. So I work, I work at St Mary's, which is a major trauma centre. We do quite a lot of damage control surgery. And the idea of damage control surgery is, is this okay if we, we talk about trauma for a second, everyone? Katie, you're the only one I can see. Give me a little thumbs up if you're happy. Okay, in the context of trauma surgery, the idea is you have a very sick patient who is dying in front of you, which is pretty much what some of these babies with NEC are. If you are in theatre for a prolonged period of time, what will happen is, is you will get this triad, which is a triad of misery or death or whatever you want to call it, of, of hypothermia, coagulopathy, and worsening acidosis. And they all feed into, I can't, that's not really a triangle, is it? They all feed into each other and they all spiral. And damage control surgery is the idea of taking your person who's critically injured, or in the case of NEC surgery, this baby who is dying in front of you, you go in, you do the absolute bare minimum to stop them from dying there and then. So for a baby with NEC, that is chop out the thing which is absolutely dead, put some clips on it and drop it all back in again. You probably don't close the abdomen as well. Okay, and it's called a blind trauma surgery. In trauma surgery, uh, you've just been stabbed in the abdomen, which is like a good way to greet yourselves in, in some parts of Northwest London. You go in, you big out, big incision down the middle, pack the abdomen, stop whatever is bleeding, you know, take out a spleen if it's smashed to pieces, repair the aorta, but that's all you do. You don't fix everything. If you've got a hole in the bowel, you put clips on it. You don't close the abdomen. And the idea is you get them back to intensive care, stabilize all the things which are going off, which are killing them, and then bring them back in four hours, two hours later. There's a guy called Aral who's a pediatric surgeon in Birmingham who who was also an army surgeon, and he's sort of written a paper about this, and he, he wrote another paper actually recently. I hope that answers your question, Quang. Another question, how long do you usually wait until attempting to rejoin and close a stoma? The answer is, um, it's a bit of a tricky one, and it's something where there are some people who think we should close them very early, and I'm in that camp. And there are some people who are a bit more laissez-faire and, and feel like what you have is you have um, a baby who 
unless you've got a very, very distal stone right by the terminal ileum, um, you're not going to absorb enough feeds to grow. So you're going to end up on PN. And if you end up on PN, you end up with liver dysfunction. And if you're really unlucky, you'll end up with liver failure. And I think closing them early and almost closing them with a planned date as soon as you do your original operation is the right thing to do. Um, there are some centers that don't do that. Um, and I think there's a bit of work going on around trying to standardize that a little bit. Okay, so um, I would always advocate for early closure and also planned closure. So if I do a stoma, I usually give a date for when the stoma is going to be closed. How much bowel do you need? Says Alice Kay. Alice, are you there, Alice? She's not going to answer me, is she, Katie? Okay, uh, so uh, the absolute numbers are nonsense. Okay, so people talk about 50 centimeters or 25 centimeters. It's total nonsense. Um, this is a historical thing. I think if you've got less than 20 small bowel and you've got no colon, the chances of getting off PN are pretty low. However, you have a meter of small bowel, and if you doesn't parastyles and it's dilated and baggy and just sits there, you will be PN dependent. And you can have babies who have centimeters of small bowel in their colon and get off PN. So it is about the bowel, I think will probably be the best way to answer your question if that's all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, you says, don't be afraid. We're all at home and look like crap. And and that is my problem. Like I look like crap. Look at this hair. Look how much hair there is there. Look, I'm drinking a beer. This is supposed to be relaxed. That's all right. I'm, I don't I don't take offence. I'm just trying to make this entertaining for you because you are at home and it's been a pretty boring time with COVID. Everyone fatigue and it's all a bit depressing. So I'm trying to make this really really depressing subject, which your colleague chose a bit more upbeat. Okay. Uh, Sidi asks, is NEC a surgical diagnosis, a medical diagnosis, or a pathological mm. NEC, strictly speaking, is a pathological diagnosis, Allergists, but I think if you've got pneumatosis, you've got NEC. Uh, so I think you can absolutely say that a baby has NEC if they've got pneumatosis. Um, as far as everything else, you know, the constellation of symptoms, um, that can be sepsis. But um, and surgically, you can definitely make a diagnosis subject. Okay. Uh, could be SIP as well. So SIP, you don't get pneumatosis. So we came back to SIP, spontaneous internal perforation. You do not get pneumatosis. You get a perforation all of a sudden out of blue in a relatively well baby. You don't get a prodromal illness. You don't get massive problems. You do get respiratory problems because you fill up the belly with air. So they will end up being then ventilated, but they don't have the coagulopathy, the plant. Um, often their lactate is pretty normal actually as well. Okay, so see. Good. Okay. Everyone okay? We detoured into trauma surgery. We're back onto NEC. Or should we do something completely different? Carry on? Okay, I'll carry on. So the problems with stomas are. Uh, the output, um, particularly if you've got a high digenostomy, the output is high, so you lose lots of fluid. You also lose lots of electrolytes, and you um, generally, uh, it's all a bit miserable. Skin care becomes a problem because the stuff that comes out is pretty toxic to the skin, and babies get skin breakdown, and enteral feeding is a problem. We need to enterally feed. Your enterocytes only get their nutrition from the luminal contents. They need glutamine to be healthy enterocytes. If you don't feed your, your gut, then you get uh, villous atrophy, which is what we all learned in medical school, and it's true. Ah, closer. Oh, yeah, hey, we, we talked about closure. We said we were going to close them early. Um, we always do a contrast study, if you can, distally, and that's to plan your surgery. So you may be you're looking for strictures. Uh, stricture formation. Most of the papers overquote the risk of stricture formation, like 30%, 40%. Um, 
the risk is probably about 10% and it's pretty predictable actually. You can usually tell the beta you're going to get strictures because you usually know what you've left behind. Yeah, so um, 10 to 50% higher in the operative group. Um, so pan and EC do these are the babies who are who are incredibly sick, get incredibly sick incredibly quickly. And the answer is that they're a real problem, and they're a real problem because it's more to do with the decision making of, of, of you've gone quickly and the parents have obviously, obviously often been transferred to a surgical unit with their baby and expecting something to happen. And actually when they do operation, you find that all of the battles affected. So you can try and temporize them with that high stoma. You can withdraw, it's really difficult to do unless it's really, really obvious. Um, and so most of them with really bad NEC, you end up having a second look at about 48, 72 hours to make some prognostic decision making. Does that really affect anything? The answer is it probably doesn't. But what it does do is it gives the parents time to process. Essentially what you're saying is, is that this baby is going to die and has something which is not compatible with life. And sometimes that's a really difficult discussion to have with some of these parents. And it's why I don't particularly like neonatal surgery. <gasps> I said it. I know I'm a pediatric surgeon who doesn't like neonatal surgery. Um, JU says, what do you consider an acceptable stoma output from a high stoma? JU, um, people go for about 20 mils per kilo before they start replacing. Um, the high output from the high stoma, you're kind of almost expecting it from some of the stomas. So you just accept whatever's coming out. Um, but I think when you're trying to feed the baby, you're trying to get the bowel a little bit healthier or trying to give them at least some enteral nutrition to protect their liver, sometimes you find the stoma is just pouring out producing 700 800 mils a day and, and then that's unacceptable and that thinks makes you think about doing it earlier asks do you tend to use loperamide in baby with high stoma losses you can do it probably works um but i think you should close them early actually use babies with a high stoma losses uh clip and drop someone talked about clip and drop so when you've got lots and lots and lots of disease, you don't have to do a stoma. You don't have to do a You can just chop the ends that, uh, whoop, what happened there? Chop the ends which are sick looking and um, leave a whole bunch of sausages to come back and join up in four to six weeks time. So you're gonna say that the baby's gonna have high aspirates because they've got nowhere for the stomach to empty and you accept that they're gonna have a funny looking belly and you're gonna accept that you're going to give them PM. Peritoneal drains. Who 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 mentioned SIP to begin with? Somebody did. Let's see. Um, somebody said something. Can you have an M if M's still there? M, I said we'd come back to SIP. In the 2000s, or we're in the 2020s now. In about the 2000s, people started to get excited about drains and the fact that if you got a pair of perforation, if you stuck a drain in, some of the babies seemed to get better. And those babies had SIP. They have a tiny little area with a tiny little hole in it. You drain their abdomen, you ventilate them, and they get better. Magic. People then said, right, well, we, we, we think we could just put drains in everybody studies and there were two randomized controlled trials which ran pretty much at the same time one in uh, run, by, run by Larry Moss in America and one run by Agostino Piero which was a European one and they both had slightly different criteria for who was going to get randomized to drain or surgery so you couldn't really met, do a meta-analysis neither of them was powered to, de to take to detect the significant difference I think what the conclusion of these two randomized control trials were is that they are a useful temporizing measure and actually if you put a drain in all you're doing is direct is delaying going to theater so from an nts perspective if you were nts people or guru transport stuff 
actually it is a temporizing matter if it's so tense from free air then putting a drain in putting a cannula in putting a finger of a glove in putting something in, in allow you to then maybe slightly less hypoxic and less acidotic is beneficial to get you to a surgical center but you're not going to prevent them having an operation unless you're lucky enough to find the baby with SIP which are pretty rare uh, uh, one of the graphs from one of those papers and basically what it said was if you had a peritoneal drain if you had a laparotomy everyone portion surviving so uh, drains didn't do anything useful Katie Eboard. Um, okay. Mm. Oh, 35 minutes of boring NEC. I told you this is boring. I told your colleague NEC was terrible, terrible topic to talk to put your people through. All right. Outcomes from NEC. Our mortality from surgical NEC see at 30 to 50 percent probably and it's unchanged so nothing natal care special surgery our mort mortality if you end up having surgery from NEC is about the same as it was 20 years ago that's depressing short bow um the registry have a lot of babies in NEC who end up being on the long-term TPN register. Uh, hang on, woo, Sudeep says, can you put a drain in an unstable neonate, come back and operate? Is that useful as part of your experience? It is not, Sudeep. If you're in a center where you can operate, operate. If they're not stable enough to go to theater, you do it on the unit. If you put a drain in, you're just delaying your operation. And if you're in a place where you can operate, you should operate. There you go. That's my view on that. I'm sure other people have other views. Uh, I should have um, uh, kind of praised this all by these are personal views. Thanks. It's too deep. Uh, this is data history, and you can see that at two years following the first PN, NEC are quite a big group of these babies. So gastrocytes, but, but but NEC um, that they, they do end up uh, long term PN. It is a bit miserable. Um, and so you might ask, what are we doing? The final thing, which is really great fun, that even if your neurodevelopmental outcomes, if you've had surgical NEC, are totally terrible. Okay, so having surgical NEC compared to medical NEC, so compared to other babies who didn't have NEC, um, NEC babies were smaller and neurodevelopmentally um, and had much worse neurodevelopmental outcomes. I'm going through this all because it's just so depressing. Uh, and there's another depressing table which is even worse. Uh, like terrible NEC gives you terrible cerebral palsy. And pretty much most of the babies with really bad cerebral palsy now had NEC as, uh, as neonates. You guys are really smart, and with your cooling and everything, you've managed to solve the HIE um, cerebral palsy, but um, NEC cerebral palsy is terrible. Stupid question, says BR. It's unlikely, BR, given the content that I've given you this evening, most of this has been pretty stupid. How do you differentiate between NEC and a septic alias? BR, that's an excellent question. And the answer is, and I hope we've covered it, if you have pneumatosis, you have NEC. If you have a distended abdomen and you're not very well, then you might just have a cardiac. So you need the pneumatosis, you need the blood in the stool, you need the uh, kind of everything else. Otherwise, it can just be sepsis. Katie says, do you know why the terrible neurodevelopmental outcomes? Is it a common etiology for both or NEC? What do you think, Katie? I don't, is it, it, I mean, is, is it because these are the small, okay. Yeah. So, so go, on, go on, Katie, go on, you, you're talking about I was gonna say, are these like the sort of small, has. sick, like deprived babies already, and they're going to get 
all a host of problems or is it like the NEC and subsequent trauma of that causes the developmental outcomes? So, so, so that the, the assumption is that, that the, the cerebral pause is a neurogetting is the brain's hit of this multi-system disease. I think the thing that NEC is the gut manifestation of whatever it was. So we think in ischemia reperfusion event, yeah, ischemia reperfusion, gut transfer, bacterial translocation, and then at all the mediators, which then damage everything else that give you renal impairments that and the probably take the brain. So this stuff floats around having had NEC. Um, also, you, I guess you're much more likely to have been hypertensive, inotropes, um, big changes in blood pressure. Um, and I think, you know, this, the things which give you NEC um, are the things that give you a bad brain. Quang says, this is an association, not a causation. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it, I think think of the brain as the end organ, as an end organ effect of this horrible inflammatory process. And I think that's probably the best way to look at it. Oh, I lost you all. Uh, Sorry, Greg, can you hear me now? Says, sorry, I, I lost everything. Greg says, um, he, Greg was asking about term NEC. NEC, metal of fish. Has anyone ever seen term NEC? Yes, sister. Yes. Good. Term and he's really like properly unwell. And then these are talking about babies who have gone home and come back through A&E with NEC. Um, incredibly unwell. Is it the same disease process? Well, it probably can't be. It probably can't be. Or there is something which has, has led you to have your ischemia reperfusion, like a really bad cardiac lesion, which gives you your NEC. But term NEC is, is, a, is a bad thing. They usually end up with really bad multi-system disease, um, lots and lots of cardiovascular instability, and very sick. So, hope that answers that. CW says, pneumatosis versus meconium on an x-ray. Any tips to differentiate without reaction or follow-up? Uh, no. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, look at the bowel itself. Um, I mean, I know the X-ray I showed you was was pretty obvious in Bondor. Does it matter? Um, it probably doesn't matter that much. I think it's probably the best thing to say. Um, if you've got a baby who you suspect of, you've got any, you do an X-ray and you think there's a bit of pneumatosis, you are going to repeat that in 24 hours anyway. So it doesn't necessarily matter whether you can spot it or not. You're still going to antibiotics. So you're still going to support them. You're still going to put them in by mouth. So. If you can't make the diagnosis of pneumatosis on an X-ray, a radiologist could this morning if it was in the middle of the night. But actually, it shouldn't matter too much. But as I've been told, he's born at term who developed and he had worse outcomes. Yes, yeah, we we we, we said that, didn't we? Yeah. True and why? Um, yeah, it is because I think if you think about the things that pre um uh, hemodynamic instability um reverse tendile flow you don't have things in. so if you think about it as a stepwise process the things in order to to knack your bowel in order for gut to take place must be pretty bad uh, and that, that's the best way that i put it okay uh so is it hopeless um are we better at risk stratifying um i don't think we are actually i think we still transfer babies around between neonatal units um, because 
surgeons won't give me an opinion on x-ray. Have any of you had that encounter? Transfer the baby, we're not going to give you an opinion on x-ray. Something like that. You have. You just don't have to fess up to it. Uh, I think some, I think you can predict who's going to do badly, actually, with experience. Uh, there are some other things that we can think about doing. Uh, there was a cooling study a while ago, um, which looks at NEC. We think this is a, it's, it's an inflammatory process, so, and we think the damage is done by inflammation, so can we switch it off? You know, should we be thinking about um, immunomodulatory drugs? Should we be thinking about uh, things to switch off IL-6, uh, like Anakinra? <gasps> oh my goodness, that's IL-6. Uh, but uh, it's uh, tocilizumab, but um, that's all being used up by COVID patients. But I think we need to be thinking a little bit differently about NEC. And if we think this is an immune-driven phenomenon, can we switch the immune system off? JU said yes. I don't know what JU said yes to, but thanks, JU. Uh, so that's it. That's all I had to say. Um, oh, hello. Hard work. I haven't even drunk on my beer. Um, any questions? Anything I should like eight? There should be more attendees. Come back and present something else. Whoever M is. Is that M as in like James Bond? No, I'd love to I'd love to. Um if you guys Tell me what you'd like. I'm really happy to do these. It doesn't take very long to, to rustle up something. And we can talk about, uh, we can talk about panarosinosis, the pain, troublesome constipation, Ugh. other neonatal stuff. I hate neonatal stuff, but we could do other neonatal stuff. You want fetal medicine counselling, anything you want. Okay. Uh, Hello. Right, um, I don't know. Hello? What was that? I have a question. Oh, ah, me. Hi, T1. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to ask in the first picture you saw of the from the surgery of the bowel, was anything solvable or you had to remove all this? So, all the work actually in the decision making process when you're actually operating. Often it's pretty easy. There's either stuff which is frankly dead and that comes out. There's stuff which is frankly healthy and that's fine as well. And then sometimes you get stuff which you're not quite sure whether it's alive or dead and in which case you just leave it in. So the idea is the principles are you preserve as much length as you can. If you think something might survive, leave it in and you come back another day and, and, and fish it all out. And join it. It's terribly easy. Like surgery in babies is, is not difficult. Um, you could all do it. it. It's not. This is not. Do you prefer to save some bowel rather and return to a not to do another surgery rather than remove a healthy, potentially healthy bowel? Yeah, and I, I think that's that's the principle of surgery of NEC, which is to maintain length. We know length is important, and I know I answered someone's question by saying sometimes you have a long length of bowel and it doesn't function, but actually you know it, it, length is important you know if you can preserve more length if you end up with 75 versus 60 percentages you, you assume they're going to do better um but but it's not it's not an accurate picture to say that length is the most important thing thank you okay does that answer your question oh thanks for talking to me as well uh there's a baby hi baby Hi. Woo. <laughs> um, anyone got anything else they'd like to ask? Katie's baby is cute, it's true. Uh, anyone got anything else they'd like to ask? Or should we all go? We're all going. Ah, last man standing. All right. Um, uh, take care, guys. Um, Katie, if you want another one, just just email me and let me know, and um, let me know when.
Um, and I think we need to work out a way of being a bit more chatty. Be better. People get more out. All right. Bye.